Welcome to Christ Reformed Church on Sunday, May 20, 2020. This is already the 10th Sunday of our COVID-19 exile. And before we begin our worship service, I'd like to highlight a number of resources that you may be interested in. Uh, the Christ Reformed YouTube page has a number of the previous uh, sermons on Romans available. If you've joined us midway and would like to go back and see some of the earlier uh, sermons, you can do that. Uh, the sermon is uh, on audio from the very beginning, so if that's of interest to you, you can find that on our church website, ChristReform.org. Uh, we also have a number of great catechism sermons from uh, Reverend Brad Lenzner, and he's been concentrating on the themes of comfort and providence, which are especially relevant during this time of uh, COVID-19 exile. I'd also encourage you, if you're a member of our church, to take a look at the Christ Reform uh, Members Only Facebook page. We have a number of prayer requests. There are announcements from the deacons and the elders about the, the things we're doing to prepare to uh, open for public worship again, if and when that time comes. And a number of prayer requests that are uh, things that uh, you can be praying for to uh, help us uh, do things better and to contact those who uh, need to be uh, contacted. There are a lot of things on that website, so I encourage you to go to the Christ Reform Members Only Facebook page. And so let's take a moment now and quiet our minds and hearts and prepare for our morning worship. Our call to worship this morning, the words of the 96th Psalm. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name to tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory, do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Beloved, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Grace be to and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ in the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. 
God's law comes to us this morning from the Gospel of Matthew, the sixth chapter, beginning at verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Dearly loved brothers and sisters, we are called to examine ourselves in the light of God's law. Let us go to God in public confession. Our Father, we are sinful and you are holy. We recognize we have heard in your law difficult words knowing how often we have offended you in thought, word, and deed, not only by obvious violations, but by failing to conform to its perfect commands, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. There is nothing in us that gives us reason for hope, for where we thought we were well, we are sick in soul. Where we thought we were holy, we are in truth unholy and ungrateful. Our hearts are filled with the love of the world, our minds are dark and are assailed by doubts. Our wills are too often given to selfishness and our bodies to laziness and unrighteousness. By sinning against our neighbors, we have also sinned against you in whose image they were created. In this time of silent confession, we bring you our particular sins. Our Father, although you are a holy God who cannot look upon sin, look upon Christ our Savior and forgive us for his sake. You have promised us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For if we do sin, we have an advocate before your throne, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Give us your pardon by your mercies, dear Father, for you have clothed us in Christ's righteousness. We ask also that you give us an increase of the grace of your Holy Spirit, so that we may learn the wisdom of your ways and walk in your holy paths. For your glory and the good of our neighbor. Brothers and sisters, you have heard the law and have confessed your sins to Almighty God. Do you believe that Jesus Christ, by his perfect life, sacrificial death, and glorious resurrection, has atoned for your sins and satisfied the wrath of God toward you. In the name of Christ and by the authority of his word, I declare to you that your sins are forgiven and that you are not under the condemnation of God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Our pastoral prayer this morning is the prayer we use most Lord's Days, and it comes from the United Reformed Church's uh, Book of Forms and Prayers. Let us go before the throne of grace and mercy. Almighty and merciful God, we realize and confess before you that if you took into account the things we have done, we would be unworthy to lift our eyes toward heaven and present our prayers before you. Our consciences accuse us and our sins testify against us. And yet in your fatherly goodness, you have adopted us in Christ and delight to hear our prayers, which we offer through his mediation. Therefore, we look to no other king and we seek no other advocate for the help that we need in this world and in the world to come. You call us to seek not only our own salvation and good, but that of your whole church and the world. And so we now do. Almighty God, we pray especially for your benediction on your holy gospel. May it be faithfully proclaimed. May the world be filled with the knowledge of your truth. And so to that end, please send workers in your field to plant and water and harvest the people for your name, but frustrate the work of those who would sow weeds of heresy and discord. Pull down all of the strongholds of Satan in this world and establish your kingdom throughout all the earth. Please give your fatherly attention to your servants who suffer persecution for the sake of the gospel and strengthen them in mind and body by your spirit through the means of grace. We pray also for those who serve our common welfare and temporal affairs. Grant those you've ordained to govern us wisdom and integrity. Give them a restraining fear of you to keep them from abusing authority and give them the knowledge that they stand under your final judgment. We ask that you would use them to contribute to the advancement of a society that is pleasing to you. May they restrain wickedness and vice promote justice and virtue, remove every obstacle to the preaching of the gospel and divine worship, so that the word of God may have free course, the kingdom of Christ may progress, and every anti-Christian power be resisted. Dear Father, who sends rain upon the just and the unjust alike, give to us also, we pray, such humility of conduct and faithfulness in our worldly callings that we may contribute to the good of our neighbors and of peaceable lives and all godliness and honor. We remember also all who suffer from physical dangers, temptation, doubt, illness of mind or body, financial distress, and especially those who may be near death. Comfort, O oh Lord, we pray, all widows and orphans, and be to them a father. Show your mercy to prisoners, to those in the military, or those whose business take them great distances. Guard their families and bring them back safely, we pray. May the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, your Son, refresh your people in their trials and give them the grace to bear the difficulties you send them for their good. Give also to us the grace to share in their suffering and provide for their needs as we are able. O Lord, bless the land with fruitful harvest. Give us wisdom and patience to be good stewards of it and the resources you graciously give us for our own callings. Keep us from exploiting your good gifts for our own selfish accumulation and grant that we may be ever mindful of our duties to each other and your creation. Order our priorities and interests so that our callings in life will promote rather than hinder our love for you and our neighbor. We ask that you would deepen the bonds between us as spouses, parents and children, and resolve conflict and strife according to your wisdom and grace. Give to those among us who are single gifts for the building up of the communion of saints, as well as faithfulness in the face of temptation, and grant that your people may build them up in the most holy faith. Strengthen us through your means of grace that we may worship you, not only with our words, but with our lives. And so build us up into one body, a city in the world whose light cannot be hidden. Make each of us, we pray, a living sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving pleasing to you, for this is our reasonable service in view of that sacrifice which alone has reconciled us finally and forever with you. And so our gracious God, we bring to your throne these intercessions on behalf of each other through that intercession of our elder brother at your right hand, even Jesus Christ, your eternal Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Congregation, please stand for the reading of God's word. Beloved, Today's Old Testament lesson comes to us from Ezekiel 11, verses 16 through 21. Therefore say, 
Thus says the Lord God, though I removed them far off among the nations, and though I scattered them among the countries, yet I have been a sanctuary for them for a while in the countries where they have gone. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. And when they come there, they will remove from from it all its detestable things and all its abominations. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for those whose heart goes after their detestable things and their abominations, I will bring their deeds upon their own heads, declares the Lord God. Let us pray. Our Father, we have heard wonderful things out of thy word. We praise you for revealing Christ by promise and shadow in these pages. Help us to understand these words for thy name's sake. Amen. The New Testament lesson is from the book of Romans, chapter 6, and verses 1 through 14. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us, who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him, In a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. Once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Shall we pray? Our Father, we have heard wonderful things out of thy word. We praise you for revealing Christ as the fulfillment of the Old Testament 
and ask you to give us your spirit so that we may understand the fullness of your truth. Amen. Paul has made the point as clearly as he can. God justifies the wicked through faith in Jesus Christ. The ground or basis of our justification is not our own works or even our faith, but the merits of Jesus Christ, including his death for our sins, his one act of obedience through which the many are declared righteous, merits which are received through faith alone. We are not in any sense justified on the basis of God's work in us. Rather, we're justified because of God's work for us. And so as we move into Romans chapter 6, all the way through the end of Romans chapter 8, Paul is going to make the point that all those who have been justified sola fide will also be sanctified. Paul cannot conceive of someone who is freely and instantaneously justified by the merits of Christ, who is not also in the process of being sanctified and conformed to the image of Christ. Justification ensures our union with Christ, which in turn ensures our sanctification. As we have seen in previous weeks in our study of Romans, the literary hinge between Paul's discussion of justification and sanctification is Romans chapter 5, especially verses 12 through 21. In the last 10 verses of Romans 5, Paul sets out the panorama of redemptive history in very broad terms, while also identifying the two main figures in the administration of the covenants, Adam and Jesus. Paul sets these two figures in direct contrast to one another. Adam is both the biological and the federal head of the human race. Under the terms of the covenant of works, which we can summarize as do this and you shall live, Adam is the federal representative head of the entire human race. And because of Adam's one act of disobedience, Paul says, the entire human race is rendered guilty and comes under the curse and sin, which is death. In Adam, we all sin. In Adam, we all die. But Jesus Christ, the second Adam, he is the head of the covenant of grace. Through his act of obedience, which stands in direct contrast to Adam's act of disobedience, all those whom Jesus represents are regarded as righteous. Through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made or reckoned or imputed as sinners. So also through the obedience of Christ, the many were made, reckoned, or imputed as righteous. As in Adam, we were made sinners and subject to death. So in Christ, we're reckoned as righteous and then set free from the tyranny of sin and death so that in Christ and through union with him, we might live. As Paul put it so wonderfully, where sin abounds, grace superabounds. The analogy between Christ and Adam, or the federal or representative heads of the covenant of works and covenant of grace respectively, that analogy becomes the basis for understanding much of Paul's discussion of sanctification. And so throughout Romans 6 to 8, all those in Adam are said to be under the dominion of sin, the law, and death. But all those in Christ are said to be set free from the dominion of sin and law and death, and now live with Christ. The analogy Paul sets out in Romans 5 between the consequences of Adam's fall, curse and death, and the free gift of life which Christ's obedience secures becomes the key to understanding what follows when Paul takes up the subject of sanctification. Douglas Moo describes this contrast in eschatological terms speaking of a transfer of realms from Adam to Christ. This eschatological focus also fits within the structure of what we identify as federal theology. Under the realm or the dominion of Adam, we're condemned because Adam is our representative under the covenant of works. He acts for all those whom he represents. We're justified when we're moved or transferred by God's grace from the realm or dominion of Adam, to the realm or dominion of Jesus Christ under the covenant of grace. 
And how this plays out in the next chapter of Romans is illustrated in a handout that you got in your morning uh, worship package by email this morning. Now, in light of this transfer of realms, uh, Anders Nygren asks the salient question, the part of Romans with which we're now dealing discusses how he who by faith is righteous shall live. He who believes in Christ has, says Nygren, through him entered into the new age and now lives in Christ. But Nygren asks, what exactly does that mean? Paul will now tell us. We can imagine the pressing pastoral questions that would immediately arise in the church in Rome, given Paul's stress upon a gracious and free justification based upon the merits of Christ received by faith alone. And the issue here is very well framed by Leon Morris, and I'll quote him. Paul's teaching that salvation is a gift from God, that it is the result of Christ's death and not our own achievement, that we obtain it by faith and not by any effort of our own marked a revolution, says Morris. And it continued to raise all sorts of questions that could never surface while it was held that law in some form was the gateway to godliness. If we're not justified through personal obedience to the law, what role then does obedience to the law play now that we are justified sola fide? Well, once Paul sets out to answer the question, how am I saved, in the sense of being delivered from God's wrath yet to come, and once he's answered that question by affirming that sinners are justified on the basis of an imputed righteousness received through faith alone, Paul now has to turn to the related question, now that I'm saved by the merits of Christ, how am I to live in Christ? Paul's focus in Romans very clearly shifts from justification, a once-for-all declarative act, to sanctification, which is both a declarative act and a lifelong process. Paul sets out the way in which these two things are necessarily related when he commands us to reckon ourselves dead to sin but alive to God. John Calvin argues that throughout this chapter, the apostle maintains that those who imagine that Christ bestows free justification upon us without imparting newness of life shamefully rend Christ asunder. And Calvin adds, quoting again, we cannot receive righteousness in Christ without at the same time laying hold on sanctification. Well, that's precisely what we see in the following section of Paul's epistle. Those who are justified by grace alone through faith alone, on account of Christ alone, are also said to be in the process of being sanctified by grace alone, through faith alone, through the work of the Holy Spirit alone. The Bible knows nothing of a justified sinner who is not also in the lifelong process of being sanctified. In this section of Romans, which runs from the beginning of chapter 6 through the end of chapter 8, that's verse 6-1 through 8-39, Paul begins by asking several rhetorical questions, very likely illustrative of the difficulties then found in the Church of Rome, questions that we probably have all heard or have asked ourselves. And the question, of course, is, shall we sin that grace may abound, or shall we sin freely because we're under grace? And Paul's answer to these questions is a resounding no way. To answer these questions, Paul will make his case as follows. First, in Romans 6, verses 1 through 11, Paul will deal with the abuse of grace, antinomianism, and set forth the distinction between the indicative, what we are in Christ, and the imperative, what we do in Christ. One is a statement of fact, indicative, one is a command, an imperative. Paul will also set out his doctrine of baptism, of union with Christ, and his notion that justified sinners are now dead to sin, both to sin's guilt as well as its power. All of these are of great significance in understanding Paul's doctrine of the Christian life. Then in Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 23, Paul does give us a series of imperatives, in effect defining and setting out what the Heidelberg Catechism summarizes as the rule of gratitude. For Paul, this is the role of the law in the Christian life. This is a so-called third use of the law, 
justified sinners are no longer slaves to sin, but are now slaves to righteousness. Christians live out their justification, no longer, no longer offering their bodies as instruments of sin. Third, in Romans 7, verses 1 through 6, Paul goes on to use an illustration from marriage to show how it is that we are dead to law, no longer controlled by the sinful nature, and now free to serve in the new way of the Spirit. It's here that Paul introduces to us the Holy Spirit as the primary agent of our sanctification. Fourth, in Romans 7, verses 7 through 12, Paul has to deal with the question of why it is that while the law is holy and righteous and good, nevertheless the law serves to expose and incite our sin to even greater levels. The answer is that while the commandment is holy and righteous and good, we're not. We are sinners. And since that is the case, the good, righteous, holy commandments of God actually bring death to us. Well, why is this? Paul will locate the basic problem in the sinful nature, the flesh, and not in the law. Fifth, Paul moves on to address the struggle with sin, which characterizes the normal Christian life. He does this in Romans 7, 13 through verse 25. And that is, as you probably know, one of the most disputed passages in all the New Testament. Why is it that while we want to obey the law of God, instead we end up sinning? Why is it that the law, which is good, leads only to our death? At the end of that, Paul laments, who will deliver me from this body of death? Because he knows what the law does to us as sinners. It excites us to even greater levels of sin. Sixth, in Romans 8, Paul turns to the antithesis between the flesh and the spirit. In verses 1 through 11, the non-Christian walks in the flesh, while the Christian now lives life in the spirit. Life in the spirit is the characteristic of the Christian life. Fascinating, but there are no imperatives found anywhere in this whole chapter, only indicatives, only statements of fact, no commands. In verses 12 through 17, Paul speaks of the fact that the justified sinner is not only being sanctified, but is also adopted into the family of God, thereby enjoying an intimate relationship with God, crying out, Abba, Father. In verses 8 through 27, Paul reminds us that the Holy Spirit intercedes for believers when we pray and that God himself will liberate the creation from decay since it is human sinfulness which subjected creation to decay in the first place. And in verses 28 through 30, Paul speaks of God's sovereign purpose. Those foreknown are also predestined. Those predestined are also called those called are also justified, and those justified are also glorified. Finally, this wonderful chapter culminates in what is known as the triumph song of verses 31 through 38, in which the struggling sinner of Romans 7 will nevertheless enjoy complete victory in Jesus Christ and has God's promise that despite the struggle with sin, the justified sinner is more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. God's grace will always triumph over human sin in the lives of his people. So with that big picture before us, let's turn to our text this morning, Romans 6, verses 1 through 14. The first verse here, Romans 6, indicates that what follows grows out of the fact that in Adam we all die, and in Christ we'll be made alive. And since that's the case, the question naturally arises, well, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? If it superabounds, well, why not just continue in sin? The question arises because of the fact that we were reckoned righteous by Christ's one act of obedience, and some were no doubt asking, well, then what place does our obedience play since we're justified by the righteousness of another? There's every likelihood that some in the church in Rome had reached this erroneous and dare I say it, dangerous conclusion that since sin abounds and grace superbounds, there's no need for a justified sinner to cease sinful activity. Apparently, some were mistakenly thinking that sinful activity results in superabounding grace. So the way to more grace is through more sin. 
as we read in verse 2, Paul's answer to such thinking is an emphatic no, as emphatic as the Greek will allow, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? The Greek meganoito, no way, means something like not a chance. There's no way on earth this is going to happen. The reason why we cannot go on sinning is clear. We died to sin. The verb here is in the aorist tense. The aorist tense means it's a completed act, meaning that for Paul, when we were moved from the federal headship of Adam to that of Jesus Christ, when we've been transferred from one realm to another, the dominion of one to the other, when we're transferred from Adam to Christ, we died to sin. When we came to faith in Jesus Christ, something definitive happened. We died to sin and we were raised to newness of life. Throughout this section, Paul will speak of this dying and rising with Christ in four distinct ways. The first way is when Christ died on the cross, he was then raised from the dead. We died with Christ, and we were raised with him from the dead. Second, in the next verse, Paul will speak of this dying and rising in connection to baptism. Third, he'll also speak of this dying and rising as an imperative or a command for all Christians. We are to die to sin and rise to newness of life on a daily basis because we've been raised with Christ's completed act. And finally, Paul will speak of this in an eschatological sense. Even though we die because of sin, we will be bodily raised with Christ on the last day. And so the pattern of Christ's life, his death followed by his resurrection, becomes the pattern of for our sanctification. In Christ, we die to sin. In Christ, we rise to newness of life. In verse 3 of Romans 6, Paul introduces the subject of baptism. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Although the introduction of a discussion of baptism may come as a surprise, if we think about it, we really shouldn't be surprised. Paul can say to members of a congregation in Rome that he's never visited, do you know that baptism into Christ entails being baptized into his death? The words are very likely part of the baptismal formula used throughout the apostolic churches. The Roman Christians have already heard these familiar words in connection with their own baptism and that of their children. And Paul invokes these familiar words to remind the Romans of the fact that when they were baptized, these same words were pronounced over them. To be baptized into Jesus Christ is to be baptized into his death. The imagery is crystal clear. Christians are people who have already died to the old way of life, which is why we cannot continue to live in sin. But to be baptized into Christ and into his death means that baptism unites us to Christ as the sign and seal of the union we have with Jesus Christ through faith. Baptism into Christ is a very characteristic way for Paul to speak. In Galatians 3.27, Paul said, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, we read, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Baptism unites us to Christ in his death. And so having been transferred through faith from the dominion of Adam to the dominion of Christ, we died. And the sign and seal of that death is our baptism into Christ. Now, Paul's words recall to mind the words of our Lord, which are recorded in Mark chapter 10, verse 38, when Jesus identifies his own coming death with baptism. And there Jesus asks, Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with a baptism with which I am baptized? Now, how that works becomes clear in verse 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Paul's point, we died in Christ because we're buried with him. Leon Morris points out something that is just so profound. 
In baptism, he says, we are interred with Christ in his tomb. Goes on to say that points made it into the creed, the Apostles' Creed, emphasizing the finality of Christ's death. As Jesus truly died and buried, so too are we when we are baptized into Christ. The old Adam in us dies in Christ, signed and sealed in baptism. But Christ's death and burial is not the end. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. As his death was followed by the triumph of the resurrection, so too our union with Christ does not end with our death to sin. We are buried with Christ in baptism, so too we are raised with Christ in baptism to newness of life. In fact, Paul says that Christ's resurrection was by or through the glory of the Father, which is probably a reference to God ushering in this new age of salvation since Jesus conquered death and overturned the curse that had been brought upon all of us by Adam. When in his great power God raised Jesus from the dead, the new creation began. And Paul makes that point very explicitly in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through chapter 6, verse 2, when he tells us that the new creation constitutes the day of salvation. When Jesus was raised bodily from the dead by the Father, the dominion of death was likewise destroyed. And because Christ has destroyed the dominion of death when he died, we died and are buried with him. So too, as he rose from the dead, we rise to newness of life, which is the very point made by Paul in verse 5, the next verse. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. To be in Christ is to be united to him in his death and his resurrection. In Adam, we're under the dominion of sin and death. In Christ, we're set free from sin and its consequences because in Christ, we have died. In Christ, we live. And this is the meaning of baptism the sign and seal of Christ's death and resurrection and of our union to him in his death and resurrection. In verses 6 to 7, Paul goes on to flesh out this a bit more thoroughly. He says, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who's died has been set free from sin. Because we're united to Christ, the old self, which is an expression used by Paul in a couple of other passages, Ephesians 4.22 and Colossians 3.9, because our old self was put to death when Christ died on the cross, we need to notice that that crucifixion, again, is an aorist tense telling us that there was a decisive end to the old self that freed us from sin. The old self, the old person, who and what we were in Adam, that person no longer reigns. The death of our old self does not mean the end of struggle with sin. In fact, Paul will clearly teach throughout this entire section that habitual sin or indwelling sin remains and puts up a fierce struggle until we actually die. But sin was characteristic of us while we were under the dominion of Adam. But now that we're under the dominion of Christ, sin becomes uncharacteristic. Sin becomes an exception, and we cannot live with it because now we are in Christ. Because the old man, the old self, the old person was nailed to the cross with Christ, the body of sin has been done away with, literally rendered powerless. A number of commentators understand Paul to be speaking of the physical body here, in the sense that as fallen, we're inherently susceptible to bodily lusts and passions. But the word body or soma can refer to the person as a whole. If taken in that sense, Paul is saying that we personally, our persons, have been rescued from the dominion of sin, what we were in Adam, so that we are no longer enslaved to it. By virtue of our union with Jesus in his death and resurrection, we've been set free from such a dominion. What we were in Adam 
no longer is true of us now that we are united to Christ. The old self, the old person crucified with Christ has been buried with him in baptism. We have been made new because we have risen to life with Christ in his resurrection. The point previously made is now explicitly stated by Paul in verse 8, namely that justification and sanctification are inextricably linked, says Paul. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We died with Christ, again in aorist tense here, indicating the definitive nature of that death. It's happened, it's done. But for all those in Christ, remember, death is never the end. Because of what God has done in Christ by faith, we believe that we will also live with Christ. Although Paul uses a future tense here, a reference to our Lord's return at the end of the age to raise our mortal bodies, the knowledge of that has very present ramifications. Because Christ has died, definitive act, we now live. And one day, we too will be raised bodily from the dead. And because of the certainty of our own bodily resurrection, our present life is transformed in light of what Christ has done in his resurrection as the first fruits of our own. And once again, in verses 9 to 10, Paul appeals to the common knowledge of his reader or hearer. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Our understanding of justification and sanctification are based upon what God has done in Jesus Christ to save us from our sin. It's very significant and important to notice that Paul does not begin his discussion of sanctification by giving us a list of things to do or a list of things to avoid. That's what we might expect, and that's frequently what fundamentalists and other religious moralists tell us to expect. But no such lists are to be found in Romans chapter 6. Rather, Paul speaks about the objectivity of what God has done, the repeated use here of the aorist tense, which is why I keep mentioning it. That's the basis for our new life in Christ. Here's what I mean. Christ died, completed act. We died with him. But Christ was raised from the dead, completed act, an act which is utterly irreversible. Jesus can't die again. Death no longer has dominion or mastery over him. Jesus has defeated death and the grave once and for all. He has accomplished, completed act, everything God intended. And having been raised from the dead, his life is singularly devoted to the Father. And that's evidenced by what Paul says about Jesus in Philippians 2, verses 8 through 11. And being found in human form as a servant, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is not going back in the tomb. Jesus is not going to go again to the cross. That work has been done. It is complete. It is finished. And we were buried and raised with Christ, ensuring that we will live, of which our baptism is the sign and the seal. The consequences of Christ's death and resurrection for our sanctification are now made clear by Paul in verse 11. Because Jesus was crucified, dead, buried, and then raised from the dead, and because we are united to him in his death and resurrection through baptism, certain consequences then must follow. As is typical of Paul's writings, the indicative, what we are in Christ, all these definitive verbs, precedes the imperative, all the commandments regarding the things we're supposed to do. When discussing sanctification, Paul's first imperative is a command for Christians to remember that Christ died, was raised, and that the Christian has been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection, so the Christian should now draw the proper conclusion. That's Paul's first command. And what is that command? So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, 
but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Just as Christ died and was raised, so too we as Christians are to reckon ourselves dead to sin in terms of its guilt and its power. We are to consider ourselves alive to God, free from sin and free from death. Paul is exhorting us to be what we are. Now that we've been set free from sin and death, we can no longer live as slaves to sin. We're to act like the free men that we are. And it's from statements like that that many Protestant theologians have spoken of sanctification as including two parts. Mortification, which is the putting to death of the old self, and vivification of the new man, the strengthening of the new life we've been given in Christ. And yes, I know we need new and better words for mortification and vivification. When verse 12 begins with, therefore, un, we should be tipped off that what follows, verses 12 through 13, is the conclusion to what Paul's just said. By reckoning ourselves dead to sin and alive to God, certain things need to happen. Certain things are going to follow. The first of those is verse 12. Let not sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Because we have died and raised with Christ, we're reminded we're no longer in Adam. We're in Christ. That's where sanctification begins, remembering that. Because Adam no longer reigns, neither does sin. And because that's the case, Paul calls us to stop acting like sin is still reigning since its reign over us is broken because we are in Christ sola fide. The reference to our mortal bodies may indicate that our bodies are subject to sinful passions, so we shouldn't obey the evil desires and lusts that arise from our fallen existence. But there's clearly an eschatological focus here as well. The stress on the mortality of our bodies means that we still live in this present evil age. We're personally personally subject to all of the evil associated with that age, the evil within, the evil all around. But we must realize that we are now in Christ. So we must live in light of the age to come. And we do this by constantly reckoning ourselves under the reign of Christ and clothed with his righteousness. We can no longer live as slaves. We can no longer live our lives to satisfy our sinful passions. Why? Because we died to all of that. The second thing Paul commands of us is found in verse 13. Do not present your members, your parts of your body, to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Since we're no longer under the reign or dominion of Adam, but under the reign or the dominion of Jesus Christ, instead of existing for the gratification of our sinful passions, the flesh, we're to renounce such sin and continually offer ourselves to God so that we might live in righteousness, using our bodies to glorify God instead of bringing dishonor upon ourselves. As Christ gave himself for our sins, so we are to give ourselves to Christ for his glory. Well, Lord willing, we'll return to verses 12 through 14 again next time, and we'll speak of how these verses are so often misinterpreted. But Paul does make a very remarkable statement in verse 14. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Now that we've been transferred from Adam to Christ, sin is no longer our master. We have been set free from its tyranny. And the law which condemns us exposes our sin. It excites our inherent sinfulness all the more. Yet sin and the law no longer have dominion over us because in Christ, grace is now the ruling principle, not law, not condemnation. For all those in Christ... The gospel, what God has done, not the law, what we must do, has the final word. As we saw in our Old Testament lesson from Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 16 through 21, and we also find in other familiar passages like Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, the prophets foretold of a messianic age as one in which the law no longer condemns because the law goes from something external on stone tablets to something internal written on our hearts. That happens when we're transferred from Adam 
to Christ, as we'll see. And because we're no longer under the reign or the dominion of Adam, and therefore under the reign or dominion of the law, we're now under the reign or the dominion of Christ. And because we are under the dominion of Jesus Christ, he will bring forth fruit in our lives, fruit that can't be brought about by personal obedience to the law, but by the Holy Spirit, whose fruits reflect our obedience to the law. Paul's point is clear. Sin is no longer our master. We are free men and women who will bear the fruit of the Spirit and who will put to death the fruit of the flesh. And all of that is because Christ has died for our sins and was raised for our justification. Beloved, we have all been baptized into Christ's death and his resurrection. So that our old self, our old man, our old person is dead, crucified with Christ, drowned in the water of baptism, interred, buried in the tomb with Christ. So that we are now raised as new men and women, truly free to obey the commandments of God, to obey the law with grateful hearts because of all that God has done for us in the person of his dear son, our Savior Jesus. And because we have died in Christ, we have been raised to glorious newness of life. Let not sin reign in our mortal bodies. As Paul exhorts all of us, Consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. And so let us strive to bring glory to God who set us free from the tyranny of sin and the law and death through the resurrection of his beloved son Jesus, of whose baptism is our sign and seal that we have died to sin and have been raised with Jesus Christ to newness of life. Amen. And let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for these wonderful words of Paul that remind us of the greatness of the saving work of Jesus. We're thankful, Father, to have been baptized into his death and into his resurrection. We're thankful, Father, that our old self has been drowned in the waters of baptism, has been buried in the tomb with Jesus, and now we have risen to newness of life. Help us, Lord, to consider the gravity of acting as though we are still in Adam, of justifying our sin. Help us, Lord, to do as Paul exhorts us to do, to reckon ourselves dead to that sin, but alive to God, so that we may bring glory to the Father by living in newness of life, striving now to obey all the commandments you've given us out of a heart filled with gratitude, out of a heart strengthened by prayer, so that we Give thanks and honor to you for all that you've done for us, unworthy and ungodly sinners. For we ask all of this in Christ's most blessed and glorious name. Amen. Amen.
our service comes to a conclusion, go with God's blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.